The Fitness Movement is brought to you by Zor Fitness. We offer coaching and individualized program design, as well as educational content for coaches and athletes. It's all one place, ZorFitness.com. All right, today we're going to talk about some competition stuff. Not exactly sure where this conversation is going to go. We're going to leave it pretty <laughs> open-ended and just kind of see what we uh, bring up. But kind of like, you know, noticing from competition, let's call it. Um, so Chris recently went to yeah. North America East semifinal, and I was at Metcon Rush. So two relatively elite comps. I mean, the average person that's at the NA East is a beast, and Metcon Rush had a pretty elite field as well, I would argue, this year. Um so yeah, we just kind of want to talk through like things that we notice from behaviors from athletes that are going there. Um, you know, just like depth of field, certain yeah, like habits and things that we see from people, and then just like overall, like maybe some some thoughts on like programming um, and like maybe maybe not considerations as much as like maybe what we see is like some differences between <laughs> semifinals and other elite comps that are out there. Um, <laughs> Starting off, Chris, any anything big picture or specifics that uh, you just yeah noticed that stood out to you as you were sitting in the stands at semis? Yeah, I mean, from an atmosphere perspective, it was. It, I don't, I don't know if you have you ever attended like one of the old school regionals back in the day. No. So, I I went a couple times and it was awesome. Like, yeah, everybody's and, got and, their section of fans. Yeah, so like this was the first top uh, like semifinal style competition I've been to that felt like the old regionals again, where it was like um, the venue was the perfect size. Um, yeah. from, you know, uh, there were times I think in CrossFit where they almost didn't accept the size of the sport, and it's like they went to these big venues, and it's like it feels empty. Yeah, that's not First, good. It, it's like you and I come from a wrestling background, right? Most of the wrestling arenas in Division One probably hold five to ten thousand people, and what happens is that's great because then it sells out, it feels full, and it's loud. Versus like you know forty five thousand dollar or forty five thousand uh, seat basketball stadium probably is not going to fill up unless you're Iowa or Pet State, right? Yeah. Um, and that's kind of how some some of it got with like. I know this is an aside, as an aside, but I don't know if you remember like the grid league back in the day. Yeah, <laughs> like what a, we were talking about it a lot this week that weekend actually because there were a couple people there who like have, like are OGs in the sport, and one of the biggest things they did wrong was like they went for Madison Square Garden for like one of their first events, oh, and it gosh. was just like they make they were get, handing away tickets to try to put people in the seats. Yeah, and it's like. If they had just gone to a facility that was ten thousand seats, they're probably sold out. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, anyways, I say all that to say that day three, the place was jammed, like it was packed. Yeah. Um, so that was one of the first things I noticed. One of the second things that I noticed is how deep the field is. So you mentioned we went to watch Mark Juan and and the North America East is is super deep. So going into re- the semifinals. In the world rankings, I think Marquand was ranked 53rd in the world, and he finished 23rd in the North America East. So yeah, it shows you how good NA East is. Yeah, and so it was like, you know, then you had a, you had or how broken the ranking system right, is. Right, right. <laughs> well, and then you had a couple guys who like you've competed against in the past who actually beat Mar- have beaten Marquand at, at a a, a hot, an elite level, I'll say local cop, and we're like, and he's he won, you know what I mean? So yeah. it was a super deep field. And then the, the one of the other things I noticed was just, or, or two other things I noticed was, A, how big the athletes have gotten. Like, I remember years ago, like when you and I were first starting and Rich Froning was like big, they like put out like stats of like the ideal CrossFit body type. And it was like- Yeah, I think Zor Fitness was number one in search for a long time for that. <laughs> yeah, and so it was like, I think it was like five eight one ninety was like the ideal size, some something along those lines. Yeah, relatively close to that because they even had used yeah. uh, when they did Linda, they used it off a uh, the, like the quote unquote average, which was they used mm-hmm. a one ninety five pound barbell. Yeah, that I watching that event, I feel like that size has gone up. Like the top guys are definitely two hundred plus. 
Yeah, and I, I think this is where we could probably start to share a little bit of programming talk as well, because I think quarterfinals it's, tested bias the bigger athlete just a little bit. Okay. Um, okay. I think you could probably argue that. I mean, I'm sure they're probably. I mean, again, I would say relatively balanced because you know people weren't dramatically complaining about it across the board. But I just think okay. I think a larger athlete could kind of scoot through, provided that they could do a bunch oh, of burpees, they'd be fine. Shit. Um. Maybe. But like there, there's some certain movements like that where it's like you know if it's a a burpee box get over that's and you had to do 150 okay that's that's a lot of burpees but you're going over a box too so you have to go over a set height where it's like mm-hmm. you know if that's a burpee you know <laughs> over bar you know Colton Mertens is just gonna slaughter everybody because he yeah. is already so low to the floor so but that's even like um like uh it was actually kind of wild because uh. Dolan Pepper and uh, Roman Krennikov kind of went back and forth that whole weekend. And both those dudes are, are big. Yeah, big boys. It was actually kind of fun to watch because like uh, they were so tight in one of the events. I think it was um, at the Box Revolver event. Yeah. And there was some controversy because you had to step down from the box. Yeah. And, Ro- and Roman definitely hopped down on the last rep. Very clearly. <laughs> yes. And Dolan got a no rep. And that's kind of why he lost. And But it was still super tight. And so, uh, in the post game, post the post workout like interview, like Roman took a shot at Dolan, and he was like, "I'm paraphrasing, but it was something along the lines of like, you know, execute better next time, and maybe you beat me." <laughs> <laughs> and so, and then, get so, my judge next time, and maybe you'll yeah, beat me. <laughs> so Dolan, Dolan chirped back, and he was like, "Well, we got we got an, we got an echo bike in the last workout, so we'll see yeah, who's standing on top at the end of that." And he beat him, and I don't know if you saw it, Ben, but after he walked across the finish line, he's all jacked up and literally points directly at. <laughs> I saw Roman. him; he's like wagging his finger at him, like in his face. <laughs> yeah. I was like, "This is great." Uh, that was one of the best taunting I've ever seen. <laughs> yes, but out it was of our great. sport. Well, that's exactly it. It's like I, I don't, I'm not someone who gets who likes necessarily like the the like excessive trash talking, but. Every sport has a little bit of heat, right? Like that's why people like the part of the reason why people like the UFC or boxing or like there's a there's a storyline there. Yeah, and but sometimes the, my thing with CrossFit is like sometimes it feels so artificial because there's there's no like there's no like real rivalries unless it was like something like that, right? Where yes. it was like that was very clearly Dallas event to win. Yeah, it's just the judge gave Krennikov a gift. Right. Yeah. And that was the only reason why it wasn't because he was fitter where I was like, oftentimes people are like, we we're just racing in lanes next to each other. And, mm-hmm. you know, one of us edges the other person out or something. And it's, it's like, it just seems so like, it's like, yeah, like, yeah, really but, cares that much. But, like, but I, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. And, but I feel like, and it was funny because after the event, you could tell like CrossFit almost doesn't like that. The heat, no, like it, that. Yeah, some people do not. Yeah. Because like, it's interesting. The, the the interview person afterwards is like, isn't it so great competing with your friends, Dolan? <laughs> <laughs> it was like, <laughs> my man just grilled this bo- this guy like after beating him, and you're gonna be like, kumbaya, like <laughs> yeah. no question of like, hey, I saw you do that. What was that all about? Like feeding into it a little bit, like because yeah. that that was not artificial. Like it was like, okay, right. Roman won because of a blown call, and where most of the, like. And Roman leaned into it. Yeah. And on, and on top, and <laughs> that on top wild, of it, to be honest. And on top of it, I learned this weekend. I hope I'm not giving away state secrets. Um, I, I was talking to someone who works for Tier, who sponsors Roman. Mm. And Roman has a translator for every interview. And she's like, she's like, yeah. I don't know why he does that. I speak to him on the phone. For every for every like contract negotiation, like he speaks perfect English. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I was like, I I turned to my boss. I was like, I kind of hope he's just like trolling. Like, I, <laughs> oh wow, no, I can't speak English. <laughs> it's like he knows it perfectly well. <laughs> so hilarious if that was the case. <laughs> That'd be so great if he just came out and said that he's like, yeah, guys, I find <laughs> I hear English and. In- yeah, I understand just fine. Yeah, you got people talking around him like this. This freaking guy, I hate him, and he's just in the corner like, I I understand all this. <laughs> um, oh, that'd be hilarious. Anyways, back to the competition. So I noticed that, and that um, 
Yeah, I was just going to add that uh, I, one of the things for the size of athlete, I think that also carried over in the semifinals with the programming. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like even in the events that you tr- traditionally think like, oh, it has 13 legless rope climbs. It should be, you know, E3 should be a, you know, small person workout. And it's like, well, not when you put in, you know, well, whatever it was, like seven rounds of I mandated step downs off of Boom Box and yeah. Echo Bike. It's like, actually, no, it's not anymore. Yeah. And the last thing I was going to say was just like, I didn't get to talk to, I, I personally did not talk to any of the athletes other than Juan, but like there was a, like an athlete area with like ice bats and stuff like that. And I was yep. talking to Juan over there. And, uh, the one girl with Tier was talking to a couple of the people who um, they sponsor. And it was interesting listening to Don. She she asked him why Don Pemper chose to wear the shoes for the workout that he chose. And he's like, oh, well, this is why, you know, I kind of felt this, a little bit of sticking. That, and I'm listening to him. And I was like, I would have never thought or like been able to perceive little like catches in the shoes on the equipment. And it, so yeah. it, to me, it's it like it's really, a soft foam box. So I'm going to use these shoes that slide yes. off the top easy versus grippy yes. ones. And it was like, it, uh, and, and it's a leg, and it's a leg, it was like, it's a legless rope climb. So I didn't need shoes for this type of shoe for this rope climb. On the way I, down, yeah. yeah. So it was like, it just reinforced like the level of detail that the people at the top take yep. that it's like down to what shoes to wear, what rips to use, what, when to attack, when to slow down, what, like there's so much thought process that goes into it that like the average athlete like couldn't even comprehend yeah yeah i mean i am not, not in a, an elite crossfit athlete like i don't get paid to do that and you know i had weeks beforehand i knew like what shoes i was yeah. gonna wear i knew if i was gonna wear a shirt for the workout or not i knew if i was gonna have it built you yeah. know if i was gonna wear you know sweat bands and you know like little things like I- so mecon rush event one it was ring muscle ups but then it had handstand walk pirouettes in it so i was like do you wear grips for that? And then it's like your grips are like <laughs> flopping around on the floor as you're trying to walk on your hands. <laughs> um, and like l- little details like that where it's like, ooh, am I going to do 30 ring muscles with no grips and then risk ripping for the, or like, you know, putting my yeah. hands in not a good spot for the rest of the competition. Um, and then it was like, to, to go back to that like detail thing, I was like, okay, I know my victory grips. If I have them kind of folded over, like I can cut, put a kink in like right by the the wrist and they'll kind of flop back over. Like you can't, it doesn't stay there where I have like newer bear complex grips. And if I fold them over at the wrist, they stay out of the way of my palm and they'll like, they'll never be on the floor. Uh, so wow. like, so I, I wore my bear complex grips for that. Um, <laughs> again, um, <laughs> so like that was one, I like, okay. I, I snatched my, the, the max um, event in a belt. And I, I was wearing rather than, um, so I have like, you know, those like rogue wrist wraps that like everybody at a box has, they're like $12 the ones and they that, like, like put them on the wrist. So they front squat terribly yeah, and it yeah, doesn't hurt as yeah, bad. Yeah. 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 Um, like the classic old man wrist wrap. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You go to the <laughs> Ma- master's fitness collective and everybody's got them on. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So like. For example, I, I don't like those because they cut off the circulation and I, I I had Isabel coming up right afterwards with 30 cleans or, or sorry, 30 snatches for time. So I wanted to, like my grip to be able to get some blood flow. So I have like those cloth ones that go around like your wrist like many times. <laughs> um, So it's like the same amount of support, but then like this not squeezing your wrist constantly. Yes. So like. If you ever notice, like, if you have your closed fists and you, like, squeeze your hand, it's, like, not as thick as if you open your hand. Yes. So, like, that you, in that position where you're actually laid back, you still get a lot of support. But then as you're opening and closing your hand, you still get some blood flow. So Mm -hmm. it's, like, I knew if I wore those wrist supports that I could do barbell cycling and it wouldn't affect that my grip endurance as much. Sure. And then I wasn't going to wear a grip for 30 or sorry, a belt for 30 snatches just because I feel like as you start to get blown up in a workout and your breathing elevates, I don't really like wearing a belt for that. Babe. Oh, which is, I think, something we've talked about before, like not really wearing a belt unless you sort of have to in a in that con environment. 
I really don't know how guys do that. Maybe it's just because they're super fit and they're not breathing that heavy. But like, like I, I know I've seen it. So I'm sure you have people who like are belting up in like a, like remember that open workout that was like the 55s. It was like 55 yeah. deadlifts, and it's like I'm freaking gassed. It's like and it's 225. Like I don't need a belt. Like I'm gonna be yeah. just fine. But you got people like belting up. I'm like my head would explode. Like just from like. The, but the, even that, the, that's one thing because it's at the beginning of the workout where you're like not breathing super hard. But if I'll you just do like, like round again. two of that and you came that's back a second yeah. time, round two, there's zero chance I'm wearing a belt for those deadlifts. Right. Yeah. So, but how was Matt, Matt Con Rush? Let's talk yeah, about that. So I was actually going to say, so that was part two of that. And then like, so obviously that was a, if people don't know, it was a heavy, a max snatch and then you rested two minutes and then you did Isabel. Um, so... For Isabel, everybody else left their lifters on and did Isabel, um, which I don't ne- not necessarily an issue. But like when I do like lighter power snatches or just like barbell cycling, um, when I'm gonna hang onto a bar, I get ten- tend to get a little toesy. And like if I'm already having an elevated heel with my lifter, it just like makes you more toesy. You're so, like, running off the platform. Every yeah, like, you like every time forward, it just forward. feels like you're like falling forward almost as you're doing your barbell cycling. So. I, as far as I know, was the only person who switched out into flats for Dude. the, for Isabel. Okay. And, um, that was one where it's like, again, like there were two 100 point events. It wasn't like the Isabel was like an afterthought tie break type thing. And I didn't see, I, I saw one person doing some touch and go snatches before they, they built to their heavy snatch what? in the warm up area. Like I didn't see anyone really doing barbell cycling, like maybe with like a 95 pound bar for like two to three reps. But like nothing beyond that. I was like, what did this you is you... equal. This is the same amount of points <laughs> as the max snatch. Where'd like, you finish? Why would you in not warm this up? Like, say it again. Where'd you finish in that event? Second. I mean, that, well, there you go. So like, I, I think this is like a really good contrast. Is like, okay, I was like, you know, thirteenth or fourteenth on the snatch. Yeah. Like this, the strength events are never gonna yeah. be like my where I make my my money, so to speak. Uh-huh. But it's like. I was able to to make up a lot of ground on the field for that second one. Like obviously I'm just like built a little bit better for you know multiple reps. Yeah. But yeah. I think also it's just like a lot of people overlook that second part. And like everybody, if you broke one to two times, you're back five to ten places. Well, so, and I, I I think some people probably erroneously look at it would look at an event like that, like, oh I'll I'll be warmed up because I'm hitting a max step. Yes, yes, exactly. And like joint wise, yes, you're good to go. But metabolic, meta, metabolically, you're not. That's no, a totally different event. No, and also like your technique needs to be completely different for thirty for time versus a one rep max. Right. And that that was probably I'm saying all this, but my main point was that all that stuff set me up where I, I did no no hip contact snatches for all thirty. Holy smokes! And that's right. that's the only reason I could hold on for that long. Right. Like. Me coming into my hip, contacting on my hip, the bar changes directions, and you're also contacting on the way back down. All that is like more tax on your grip. Whereas mm-hmm. if you can just do it where it's a no contact, you can still punch your way underneath and you can save your your lockout and your upper body a bit. But then it really is a, you know, yeah, a significant difference in terms of like how much grip input there is. So yeah. for me, it was... I wasn't going to fail the stash because I couldn't pull it anymore. I was going to fail it because I um, couldn't hold on to it, essentially. Like, right. It, it, every time I've done grace, and that's clean and jerks, but like that, that's blowing up my grip really bad where I just can't hold on. I drop it and just do singles the rest of the way because of that. So, yeah, I, I like, I really think that's the only reason I finished where I did in that event was because I yeah. ended up barbell cycling that way. But I, and I don't think that other people couldn't do it. I just think they didn't think about it. Like they just didn't really process to do it that way. Yeah. And and I think one more thing that was similar to that was we had an event with farmers carries and legless rope climbs, which is obviously going to be like a, a grip disaster. Um, and, and we had shuttle runs. That was like sort of like essentially what became a recovery run for every person in the, in the field. So it was like recovery shuttle run into farmers carries then you'd handstand push us into the the like strip climbs and rope climbs and it was um like these uh yeah just like big like feed bags almost that you were carrying um they're like the 
like ruck bags that you like put on your shoulders. What? Are try they called tea bags? What, try to tell what state that is from when he's referring to a sandbag as a feed bag. Like, I'm sure that's never, what they're called, like on the, the website not, or whatever. I, listen, they might be, but I've never looked up the name, and I would have never <laughs> thought to, to call them feed bags. But I, I also did not grow up with a cow in my bedroom, so there's also that <laughs> cow in my bedroom. No, it was in my backyard, Chris. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. Anyway, it was like these two big bags with, with handles, and I uh, similarly I like this is where I like tried to make up a lot of ground was like you know everybody thinks like oh I got to hang on to the bag. Well, a obviously you could break it, but if you can break it and walk faster and get done in the same amount of time, you're now like your your work to rest ratio for your grip is way improved, mm-hmm. and that's like the biggest thing for the legless rope climbs. So I literally had the guy next to me in the lane, and he was like man, what the, what the heck? You were like practicing running with the, the hundreds in each hand. And I was like, yeah, man, like run slow before that. That's your rest and carry fast. So like, yeah. that was another like simple thing that it's like, it doesn't seem like much, but, and, and, but it makes a big difference. Yeah. The last one I have is in the final, there's 180 double unders in a row. And I got done with that section first. And it was like, I, I can just double under faster than people. And also across the entire thing, and it obviously it took me less time if I'm, I'm moving faster. But then, if I combine all the jumps, I jumped less high than every other person on the floor. Right. So like little things like that well, doesn't also, seem like much, but when you are at a similar fitness level to, you know, ten other people on the floor, and you can, you know, finish ahead of them, that's what makes a difference. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's part of what makes your double under so fast is your ability to turn the rope. But then for those of you that don't know, like Ben's probably five eight, five nine and Oh, you're you, so generous. <laughs> but and uses the rope like to be politically correct, like a little person would use the size <laughs> rope he has. I don't know how it's physically possible, but he, he does it. I think uh the ropes are labeled like like four eight to like five two <laughs> for, the, for yeah. the one I can use at our gym. Uh, it's yeah. crazy. Short rope. Then you don't have to sp- you know, it's easier to spin it if it's short. Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, Anything else you noticed? Yeah. So less about programming or like, you know, just how I'm so much better at planning these workouts than other people. But because uh, <laughs> wow. that's what I feel like I just talked about for the last 15 minutes. I feel a little but, uh, bit self-conscious about how much I talked about myself. But uh, I mean, I would say like one of the things that I always come back to in, in competitions like this is just like professionalism. And it it's always surprises me how people who are pretty fit sometimes are just not very professional in how they go about things. Like seeing athletes who are just incredibly lazy with warmups and just like won't do any primer work. They'll do like a little bit of, you know, movement prep. They'll ride the bike for a few minutes. They'll do a few of the movement, like few reps of ring muscle ups or whatever that's coming up. And then they just sort of like swing their arms and are ready to go. Um, and I think sometimes some athletes are just a little bit more inclined to do that. Like they prefer less warm up, but also I think people at the highest level, don't do that. Oh, absolutely. Like, it's at a certain level that, I mean, I don't think people at the high, I don't think there's, I don't want to say anyone, people at the highest level don't do that. But that can be a differentiating factor between like that, oh, I could qualify for semifinals versus the like, no, I'm in the semifinals and competing with the big boys. At or he won semifinals versus heat three. Yeah. It's like, yeah, it's those little things, because the, the 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 guys and girls who take it that seriously, and combine it with the fact that they're, um, like good athletes to start with, yeah, um, and 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 strong and fast and talented, it's like, okay, well, that's the separator at that point, or one mm-hmm. of the separators, I should say. Yeah, I guess that's that's part of it too. Is like, for the best athletes, they're actively searching to find the ways where they can get like that <laughs> tiny edge mm-hmm. and like for ath- like people can be really good athletes and really talented for lack of a better word like they they have good fitness level and 
maybe just like good metrics and they're they're like you know if you did testing with them you'd be like oh wow yeah. this is incredible right and then you have other athletes where you know yeah they're like their metrics are good but like they're finishing mm-hmm. better than they they are on paper um yeah. which i feel like like somebody like rich is probably the best example of that like if you took Frazier and you took any of his metrics, they're all better than everybody else, and that's why he won everything. Um, not to say that he wasn't like a gamer, because um, he certainly was. But like, I think like, and maybe Rich isn't the best example because he was obviously incredibly here, talented too. But I think here's a better example is yeah, like uh, looking at the women's field. So um, Tia Claire Toomey was there, and she's she's both right. Like she yes. dissects everything, and it's just physically like superior the best and mentally just a stone cold freaking killer um but then Haley adams was back yeah. and i would qualify Haley adams as someone who's like for the sport of crossfit like endurance wise she's awesome but like i don't know if you remember that snatch she hit years ago that 185 snatch at it was uh at the mac i think i did see a video of that recently actually it was ross <laughs> You know, I mean, it was like, I don't know how she did it. Her Bambi legs are all over the place. Like, <laughs> literally, it looks like her body's crumbling underneath this snatch as she stands it up. And yeah. so it's, and so not that like you shouldn't disclaimer. be able to snatch that, but you did. Slammer, this is not advised. Like, we don't, but, but she's just like, it's advised if you want to go to the CrossFit games. Well, there you go. But she, she's someone who I, I think, and, and I've heard like interviews with like Chris Henshaw talk about her that like, He loved, he loves coaching her because she's dialed into that stuff and will ask questions to him about how do I get better at this? How do I get, so she seems like more of someone who's like, maybe by your stereotypical metrics is not quote unquote built for the sport because she's a little more long lived, but like she just makes certain movements work for her and she's a gamer and a dog and like, and then looks for those little edges and technique and, and strategy. And then she's around rich. So that helps too. But. I think that comparison is one is is one that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, because someone like Haley would have totally valid every excuse in the book for like, I'm not built great for CrossFit. Right. <laughs> like, there's lots of people who are built better for CrossFit than her. I'm like, oh, I don't know if you'll ever be elite. Like, you just, you know, just anthropometrically, it's going to be tough. Right. <laughs> and like, yet she found a way. And there's, there's a bunch of other people that are similar to that, where it's like, you look at them on paper, it's like, just looking at like your, your height and your limb length and all this stuff, like you shouldn't be through. Yeah. And they're good enough. Um, well, that, or they well, find like, a way to be good enough, I should say. Yeah. That's like, a, I mean, this is really dating myself, but like back in the day at like the Southwest regional, um, one year, Tommy Hackenbrook won the event yeah. and he's a former division one linebacker. So he's like massive for the sport and yeah, then he's chris always super Spiel- powerful and then chris spieler took second and oh was- that was the that was the what what was it it was like 106 pull-ups and 53 overhead squats or something weird yeah so like he took so he Spiel- not 53 uh, overhead squats it was i forget so hackenbrook won that region and spieler took second in the region and spieler is was like five two one forty so like yeah so neither of those guys are built ideally for the sport right the guys who are built ideal for the sport are now is like um shoot what's his name now jeff adler yeah right like he he is probably five five eight five nine two hundred pounds um but yeah it's like there's ways for you to find in workouts and pro and competitions and program design like Okay, here's where I'm gonna give my points. Here's where I'm gonna give plan this workout to to not lose too many points, stuff like that. Yeah, um, yeah that, that brings up another, another good point. I was talking with Sam Hagen about this actually the other de- the other week, and it was like, here. yeah, he had just gotten done with the comp yeah. um, okay. ACC, and it, we were like debriefing it, and it was one of the things was like, you know, you have your plan of attack for how you want to do a workout, but then a lot of people just kind of stop there. Um, whereas like you also have to consider what other people are going to do and make minor adjustments to your plan based on that. Now they can't yeah. be like major or you're going to implode and you already know that. Right. Um, however, 
if you don't make any adjustments, you could just get completely buried in a workout that you could have actually placed okay in um, if you don't consider it at all. So like there's this like fine line between like you have to like ra- like do the race yeah. in front of you, but then also not like neglect but, uh, like your own pacing strategy mm-hmm. and like what your own, you know, realistic constraints on your capacity is. Yeah. And, and that's a skill in of itself, right? Like at, at, at its basis form, CrossFit is just fitness racing, right? It's a race with like movements you see in a gym. So part of racing is, I don't know, racing like, oh, hey, there's someone in front of me and I got to go catch them. Um, but it's a double edged sword because you'll have people who will see someone ahead of them in, at a certain point in the workout and try to catch them. And you as a mm. coach are like, no don't do that (laughs) and then it's just like you just watch them crash and burn but then there's also a sense of like when you're an athlete in a workout and i think we've all been here too it's like it's like okay you peek at the clock like all right i'm way ahead i'm I'm ahead of my practice time i feel good and if i feel good at this point it's okay yeah kind of to open up the throttle yeah yes and it's like we're coming towards the back half of the workout and like some people are starting to maybe pull away or catch up wherever you are in in the workout and it's like all right i gotta just hang on here and like really just push the throttle because i can maybe finish second in this workout or i could win this workout or i can move from 12th to 9th you know mm-hmm. um and kn- knowing that and knowing when to push that point and like really be a competitor and when other times to be like no i have to run my own race don't worry about them they're either immensely fitter than me or way dumber than me, and both are okay. Like, yeah. and so that's a skill too. Yeah, very good. Uh, yeah, I, I think. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's I don't I don't really know how to teach that. Besides, like maybe giving a few like uh, pointers as to like, hey, at this point in the race, like you know, if you feel this way, this is when you can start to to deviate from this plan. Yeah. You know, or or even like, for example, it's more okay to do this in a in the back half of this type of workout. Like, yeah. okay, it's a, a five round workout. If one round three you feel okay, that's when you can really start to open it up. The first two rounds, it's like a, a hard no for improving your like your times or your splits, right? Like we just want you to, to yeah. go at a certain thing. And then it's like, you know, for uh something like Chad that's coming up for the CrossFit games. It's like, you know, you are not allowed to go out past your, your scheduled, you know, pacing strategy until you're, you know, two thirds of the way through the workout because it's such a long workout. Yeah. Like you just have to be a little bit more like, Nope, this is what we're doing. We have to stick with our plan a little bit more diligently. And I guess what it, what it really comes down to is like risk reward where if you're early, the, the potential, for you actually having a, a positive return on going out faster is really slim. Whereas if you if you negative split, you go faster in the second half, you're in a good spot. And obviously if you uh, kind of tail off a little bit, you're gonna still gonna be okay to kind of slug your way through the rest of the workout. Yep. So yeah, again, I, I think, I don't know if people are gonna find this interesting or not, but, uh, you know, I think those sorts of observations as someone who's looking to be, in, if you're, if people are really caring about the performance, they should find that interesting. Um, or at least informative and insightful. Yeah. I mean, if you're a coach, you should care about it if you w- want to coach good athletes. And if you're an athlete, either you don't really care about how good you are, you should <laughs> probably care about. Uh, <laughs> All right, care. let's talk about pacing strategy. Yeah. I'll figure it out. But for real, like yeah. I'll go off feel. Okay. All right. Well, that's worked great for you the last 10 hundred times, but <laughs> we'll just try it again. Yeah, for real. It's like that guy drinking co- that meme, the guy drinking coffee in the burning house. And he's like, this is fine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, that's literally every cross that worked out. People were like, oh, it looked like you should have just picked the bar and went. I'm like, <laughs> you'll understand. Like my house was burning down and I was in the middle of it. <laughs> That was literally like, oh, the one workout in the Conrush, I was just 
completely imploding. <laughs> and people were like, man, it looked like you looked fine. You should just picked it up the bar. I was like, you don't understand what was going on. <laughs> <laughs> on the inside all signals were beeping at me on the inside yeah. it's like when you're in a workout and you start to get tunnel yes. vision like the world starts to close in on you <laughs> uh, yeah oh yeah I, I was in a I, I forget who i told this to but i was like i was in an unproductive level of hurt in that workout <laughs> hey, uh, that happens too well uh yeah, if you made it this far into it, drop us a comment and let us know what what you actually found useful out of this, so we can uh, glean something out of it. But um, yeah, if you got other questions or if you, you want us to debrief other comps in like more detail, let us know that as well. Um, yeah, let us know on socials or drop us a comment. So, thanks, Chris. You got it, buddy. See ya. Thanks for listening today. If you're someone who just started listening to the show. I would encourage you to subscribe so you can stay up to date. If you're someone who's been listening for a while, I would encourage you to rate and review the show. And lastly, the best thing that you can do to support our work is also the best thing that you can do for your performance. And that is by hiring one of our coaches. Until next time, stay the course.